Good evening. It's a great honor and privilege to introduce my speaker, Professor Sandeep Tivedi. And there's an added uh, proud, you can say we are proud of this, because uh, Sandeep happens to be an alumnus of our institute. So he was a pilot integrated MSc student in our department from 1980 to 85. He got his MSc in 1985 and then went to Caltech and he got his PhD from Caltech in 1990 working under the guidance of John Preskill. And then from 90 to 92, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton. And then he went back to Caltech with a very prestigious postdoctoral fellowship there. But there for two more years before he moved to Fermilab as a scientist there. And then he continued there till 1999. He came back to India in 1999 and joined the and he has been there for, since that time. And uh, he has got many awards and prizes, I'll mention only a few. So in 2005, he got Sandi Swarov Patnagar Prize. In 2010, he got Infosys Prize. 2011, he was awarded the Distinguished Alumnus Award of our institute. He is also elected fellow of Indian National Science Academy and uh, Indian Academy of Sciences, Bangalore. So we are looking forward to this inflation symmetries and the Big Bang. Just to mention that this inflation, interestingly, some people ask whether this has anything to do with inflation in economics. The answer of course will be given by So um, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Chaudhary, for that very kind introduction. And uh, good evening, everybody. You know, let me say, uh, as was mentioned uh, by uh, Professor Agarwal also and Professor Chaudhary, you know, this is a, a very, very special moment for me. In fact, to be perfectly honest, I'm really quite overwhelmed by it uh, because I'm an alumnus of uh, IIT Kanpur and uh, I owe more than I can express possibly to, to this institution. So for me to be able to stand here in L7 and, and be able to give a, a talk like this. It's, it's a very, very big thing for me. And I, I thank the Infosys Science Foundation, and I thank all of you here in IIT Kanpur for making this occasion possible. Uh, I'm going to start. I hope since it's a, such a special occasion for me, please allow me to start with a few personal reminiscences, and then we'll talk about the, the science content also. Uh, you know, I joined IIT Kanpur in 1985, and the first lecture I attended was in L7. And it's, you know, it's etched in my mind, you won't believe it, as if it were yesterday. This is now 35 years ago, and it's etched in my mind. The lecture was on Physics 101, given by Professor V.K. Deshpande, and he was a truly inspirational lecturer. Okay, this was a time before any AIDS. He lectured on the blackboard. He, has, he had this fantastic handwriting, but more than that, a clarity of thought and concept, which was just amazing. The, the level, the gap between my school teaching and what I got in that first lecture, which was on the operational definition of quantities, I could still maybe give it to you, you know, verbatim, was amazing. Uh, Oh, sorry, 80, 80, 80, I finished in 85. Sorry, sorry, got it wrong, got it wrong. I, I hope there aren't more mistakes in the talk. Now, my unbelievable luck was that I also had Professor Deshpande as my tutor in Physics 102, and that sealed my fate. I had to do physics after that. Another few interesting things. On my second day in IIT to escape ragging, I went to the library and <laughs> You know, some of you might have done that, and um, because that was a safe way to escape. And I found a copy of this amazing book, Space Time Physics by Vila and Taylor. I, if, if there are some physics students here, are there some physics students here? Could you raise your hands? Okay, okay, great. I'm so happy to see you. So, this is an amazing book for special relativity. It's the only book you ever need to read for special relativity. You can solve the most complicated problems. Uh, you know, by just reading a few pages of this book. And I was looking for this book in school. Someone had told me I had not been able to find it. I found it in this great library. And then I was worried that the seniors will catch me and I won't uh, be able to find this book again. So I locked myself in the bathroom 
which is still there. I took my kids there yesterday, and I read the book from dawn to dusk till the library closed, you know. And uh, that uh, was, you know, just made me more convinced. Later on, I came under the spell of Professor H.S. Money. Uh, some of you might have overlapped with him here as colleagues. Uh, he was another amazing, amazing teacher, very inspirational, uh, and really was like a father figure for me, very charismatic. Here, I have a picture of his. I couldn't find a picture of Professor Deshpande. And in fact, I learned about the wonders of cosmology, which I'll tell you about, and particle physics from him first. So I'm really specially happy that I can be here to give you a, a talk on, on these subjects. And well, we'll slowly um, come to the science, but let me say I would like to dedicate this lecture for all these reasons to these two remarkable teachers, the late Professor V.K. Deshpande, he's no more, and Professor H.S. Mani, who is uh, in Chennai now, and I get to meet him once in a while. Uh, for, for everything they did for me. Now, the amazing thing, and this is the last thing, and then we'll go to science, is that, you know, these remarkable teachers were not alone. You see, IIT Kanpur has really been, you all know this, but well, let me take this occasion to say, has really been the cradle as far as Indian physics is concerned. This is not an exaggeration. If you look at the list of alumni, it's a veritable who's who of Indian physics people at leading places abroad in, in, in India who were all nurtured here. So it's a very, very special place, and it was possible because of these remarkable teachers, okay? Really, really remarkable teachers leading IITK to play such an exemplary role um, in Indian science. And so I think I'm really very proud to be associated with this institution and to have the opportunity to give this talk today. Okay. My talk is about cosmology. Yesterday we had a talk by Professor Tole, which if you like was looking inward. How is it that we manage to think at all? Today I'd like to invite you all to look outward and look outward to the longest, largest of distance scales, the longest of time scales available to us in the universe. That is the domain of cosmology. Okay, now at first it might seem to you all, it certainly seemed to me that this is maybe too ambitious. After all, as we learned yesterday, our brains were not evolved to do even integral calculus far, do cosmology. Okay, they, it was evolved to maybe hunt whatever or gather whatever food. We are, after all, a accident of chance or evolution on this tiny planet small planet in an ordinary solar system, in an ordinary galaxy, in some corner of the universe. Here is the Milky Way, a typical spiral galaxy. In this universe, this vast universe, perhaps infinite, we don't know for sure, certainly very, very big. How big? At least as big as about 13 billion light years in size. 13 billion light years, one year has pi into 10 to the 7 seconds, light goes at 3 into 10 to the 8 meters per second, 13 billion light years, you can compute the distance. You know, that's how big the universe is. It seems maybe too ambitious that we could possibly understand the universe on these grand dimensions, epoch scales, just with the tools we have at our disposal. The universe is big, maybe even infinite. At first, it seems unimaginable that we can understand the universe. Yet, and this is what my talk will be about, remarkably, this is exactly what has happened. Questions that humankind has wondered about from ancient times. How did the universe begin? How will it end? And so on. Have slowly but surely moved from the domain of speculation into the domain of science. And what is remarkable is that this has happened. This progress is the topic of my talk. And what's remarkable is that this has happened really over the past decade or so. Okay? It's over this time scale, very recently, after I left IIT Kanpur, that this remarkable transformation has happened in our understanding. I think it's a remarkable set of developments. Of course, every scientist thinks the field they work in is truly remarkable. But just for the scale and the grandeur of this, this set of developments, I really think it's without, with very few parallels, 
And it's, you know, certainly in our times, I think it's one of the great stories of science. And so I'm very happy to be able to share it with you. Now, what has driven this progress is actually experiment. You see, for, for years, cosmology belonged in the domain of speculation, exactly because experiments on this scale were so hard to do, almost impossible. And in fact, when I first learned cosmology here and then in my PhD years, it used to be said about cosmologists that they were always in error but never in doubt, you know? And they were always in error because the experiments were so uncertain. If you got your theory wrong by a couple of orders of magnitude, it didn't much matter, you know, and so on. But of course, they were always very certain that they knew what, they, what, they, what was correct. But today, and this is the big change, as I will show you, the data we have is accurate to one part in, in 10 to the 5, okay? And this is data about the very early universe, or equivalently, the universe on very long time scales. Because if light comes to us from very early, it traverses a good part of the universe in getting to us, and therefore traverses very long distances. Okay, so very early is also very far in the past, and therefore long distances. So anyway, so this is the change. It's this, the fact that the experimentalists have shown such remarkable ingenuity in being able to do experiments of such a challenging nature with such accuracy. This is what has changed the entire field. And this set of experiments, which I'll mention a few of today, is what provides the context for these remarkable developments. And as a result, we know a great deal about the universe today at large distance and time scales quite precisely. So that's the general starting. Now, I won't be able to give you a grand tour to all, through all these developments, but I'll take a, a few of them to illustrate the story and then invite you to, to go to the library and find these great books, but maybe not lock yourself in the bathroom and try to read more about them. What I'll try to show you is how these developments teach us about the initial conditions of the universe. What happened very far in the past, so far in the past that experiments cannot directly probe that epoch at all. But since the experiments which can be done at an ep which can be done probing an epoch somewhat later are so precise, we can use the known laws of physics which we know well and have tested in the laboratory to extrapolate back with confidence to very early in the history of the universe. And that tells us that the initial conditions were really very special. What do I mean by this? In what way were they special? And how do we know this? How reliable is the extrapolation? And where might it fail? That's what we'll talk about today. So we'll start by first discussing why we think the initial conditions were special. Then, because they were special, and physicists don't like surprises, as theorists, I'll discuss a theory which attempts to explain how these very special conditions arose. And this theory goes by the name of inflation. It doesn't refer to inflation in economics, as was pointed out. Much more exciting, sorry. Um, and it refers to a very spectacular phase in the very early history of the universe, which I'll tell you about. This is a theory, but it leads to observable consequences much later in the history of the universe, which we can hope to probe today as the experiments get better. And that is how we hope to validate this theory of inflation. And so towards the end, we'll talk about some of these observational consequences, which can be deduced purely from symmetry principles, some of them, without using too many details about a specific model that implements this idea of inflation. And um, that's always a good thing to do if you can do, if you can argue robustly from general grounds of principles and so on. So I'll try to illustrate that here and then end with some conclusions. Well, to go to the beginning of how these spectacular developments unfolded, it actually began with the discovery of the cosmic microwave background radiation, what's called CMB, by Penzias and Wilson. Now, you know, this is one of the great serendipitous discoveries of the 20th century. These were radio engineers. They were not physicists. They knew nothing about cosmology. 
they were charged, they worked for Bell Labs, and Bell Labs wanted to send up satellites so that they could bounce signals off satellites and do telephony. Okay, so a, a very mundane engineering problem. And they were setting up the antenna to be able to, you know, have those send signals bounce off satellites and be received. So they built these receivers and they found that there was some, here is a picture of, of the two of them with their, um, it was a biggish horn antenna. And, um, and okay, well, the so radio engineers, and they, they actually won the Nobel Prize for this really remarkable discovery. But just to tell you how it unfolded, you know, they built the receiver, and they found there was some low, steady, mysterious noise. They just couldn't get rid of it. And the supervisors told them, oh, you did a bad job. Look at the circuit. They looked at it, can't get rid of the noise, broke their heads about it. Finally, they said, oh, one of them said, you know, it might be pigeons. Maybe the pigeons have gone and dropped put their droppings there, that's causing the noise. So they climbed up, they cleaned all that out, noise wouldn't go away. Persisted day and night, importantly, did not come from the earth, did not come from the sun, did not come from the galactic plane. So they were very, very puzzled about it. But they didn't quite know what it was about, due to. So that was the engineers. Now, this was in New Jersey, not far away from them. In Princeton University, there were a bunch of physicists. They knew all about the universe. They had thought a great deal about the Big Bang. They had almost, and they knew that a consequence of the Big Bang might be that you have these dull embers of the initial primordial fires, now very cool, but still around, which you might be able to detect. And if you could detect those dull embers, then that's more or less a direct confirmation of the initial Big Bang, the primeval fires, as I said, that raged. So they were keen to look, look for them, but they didn't have the money that Bell Labs had, and they hadn't built the radio receivers. Now news reached them somehow that Penzias and Wilson had this noise that couldn't be got rid of, and they said, oh, maybe this is, this is a signal from the Big Bang. And so, the two sides got together, they wrote back-to-back -back papers. So the physicists were Dickey, Peebles, Roll, and Wilkinson, who interpreted the signal as being of cosmological origin. And that is how then, for the first time, we found we could observe signals, not quite from the Big Bang, but very early on, and carrying an imprint of what happened very early on in the universe. These poor physicists didn't get the Nobel Prize, the engineers won out, so maybe there's a moral there as well. So that's how it began. Then a, a satellite was sent up later, the Kobe satellite, to measure the, 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 t the signal. And the likely guess was that it's a black body spectrum. OK, all of you know this is IIT, great. I hope all of you know what a black body spectrum is, characterized by a single number, right, the temperature. So this satellite went up. One of its main missions was to check whether the spectrum is of black body type and then extract a temperature. We'll come back to the temperature. Here's the, it was a satellite experiment, carried a few instruments. And look at what the curve they got. This is the curve they got. This is experimental, uh, you know, in IIT I would often get into trouble being more theoretically inclined. You plot a graph without error bars, then the teacher comes and beats you up, you know. Here, it's not that I didn't have a good training at IIT. The reason I don't have any error bars is that they are so small, you can't see them, okay. This is a perfect near, this is a very good fit to the black body spectrum. In fact, it's a better fit to the black body spectrum than you can get on any Earth-based experiment today. Okay, imagine, because there's always too much thermal noise or some noise on Earth, but out in space, looking at the signals which come to us little after the Big Bang, you get the best measurement of the black body spectrum we have today. So that tells you, that tells you about the remarkable experiments that are done. And it was a very good fit to black body, and they extracted from it this temperature to uh, one part in 10 to the 4, 2.728 with an error degrees Kelvin. So that was the next big development. Um, and again, a Nobel Prize was given to John Mather and Smooth for this uh, great discovery. Here they are celebrating uh, their, their well-deserved Nobel Prize. Now, you know, this is something very interesting. You all know that the black body radiation curve took a long time to understand in physics. In fact, 
Planck developed the idea, the hypothesis that light came in quanta to be able to explain that curve I showed you. Okay, and today you see this curve which, which really is quantum in its origin, which you cannot understand except for quantum mechanics, plays such an important clue in, understand, in our understanding of the universe at the longest of distance scales, at cosmological scales. So imagine, what a, so look at what a beautiful tie-in this is between physics at the smallest of length scales, at the really quantum, that connecting to our understanding of cosmology the physics of the largest of distance scales. And as we go ahead in this talk today, you'll see more examples of that. And you know, that's one of these wondrous things about, about our subject of physics, that everything is actually tied together from the smallest to the longest of distance scales. Okay, so that was another big milestone. But we've gone much further today. And today what we can do is measure the cosmic microwave background as a function of the angle on the sky. So what they do is, they look in one direction, it's a black body to very good approximation, and they extract a temperature. And then they look at another direction, and again, it's a black body to very good approximation, but with a slightly different temperature. And they measure these temperature differences as a function of the angular separation, okay? So you can take some two points separated by one degree, or by four degrees, or by seven degrees, you know, and measure the two-point correlation function, okay? How does the temperature here correlate with the temperature somewhere else as a function of angle? And that is an entire function worth of information for you, okay? Which then teaches you a lot more than that single number. So that's what's been done. These temperature differences are one part in 10 to the five. So you really need to have very good measurement capability to be able to measure it. You have to send up a satellite, you have to get all your calorimetry perfect and so on, which they've all done. And today, it's actually not a micro Kelvin, but, a, but 10 micro Kelvin. So uh, temperature differences to one part in 10 to the five can be measured. And it tells us a, a great deal of information about the early universe. Here's the WMAP satellite. This is a map um, they have produced of the sky, uh, and blue spots are slightly cooler, about one part in 10 to the five. Red spots are slightly hotter, one part in 10 to the sky. And this has a wealth of information, which then tells us a great deal about the early universe. Here it is in more detail. This is, and I imagine this is, um, this is a map of the universe to give you a time scale, the universe today is about 13 billion years old, okay? And this information comes to us, not quite from the Big Bang, but when the universe was about three, about 4,000, 400,000, sorry, 400,000 years old. 400,000 years is a big time scale, but compared to 13 billion years is nothing. So almost from the beginnings of the universe. And we have this information in excruciatingly detailed form here. Okay, and that's why, that's why when I say we know about the universe in, 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 with some confidence at this level, um, I, I have solid grounds to say that. Here is the information again, now not plotted as a function of angle, but multipole moment, which is a Fourier transform. And now you see there are error bars, okay, in the data, the, the dots are the data, the red is a curve, a theoretical curve, which has only five input parameters in it, but it goes through a very large number. L here actually goes up to about a few thousand. And except for the errors here, which could be statistical actually, you see that the theory fits along with these bumps, the data pretty well, okay? And this theory is not very contrived. As I said, it has five parameters. And so then from that you extract the five parameters and you try to learn about the universe. That's the kind of game we like to play in, in this whole uh, subject. Okay, so um, these advances teach us, as I said, something very special, it's teach us actually that the initial conditions of the universe were very special, and that's what I'd like to turn to next and tell you more about. And in particular, they tell us that the universe in the far past was very isotropic and homogeneous. Now, what do these two words mean? Isotropy means that the universe was rotationally symmetric. You see, that was a map of the temperature of the CMB, and the fluctuations were only one part in 10 to the five. So that means to good approximation, the temperature is the same as you change angle, and that's evidence that the universe was to good approximation rotationally symmetric, at least at that epoch from where this light imaged in the CMB is coming to us, okay? 
Um, similarly, there's evidence, which I'm not going to tell you about today, that the universe is also translationally invariant. Okay, so instead of rotating, you can also translate. I can move back and forth in three dimensions, x, y, and z. And again, the universe is invariant, meaning it looks the same. On big enough scales, when you average over our galaxy, go to clumps of galaxies, the universe looks the same on an average, uh, no matter where you are in the universe. So it has these symmetries, and, and symmetries are important to think about and try to understand uh, this is important always in science, it's important in nature, and is actually important, as you all know, for us in so beauty. And we'll use symmetries uh, in an important way in the talk. So let me just spend two minutes to try and illustrate that, just because I wasn't quite sure what the audience is like. Here is, of course, a famous example of a symmetric, very symmetric structure, the Taj Mahal. And we will all agree that the reflection symmetry, right, about the midpoint, adds to our sense of aesthetics about it. And uh, well, if you look at it at night, I think it looks maybe even more beautiful. And perhaps the reason for that is, here there's a reflection in the Yamuna, so that besides left and right, there's also a top and down symmetry here in the problem. So symmetries are always useful and always beautiful. And surely, when it comes to the universe, when it comes to the cosmos itself, we expect nature to have the good taste to use symmetries you know, in our description at the grandest of scales, and that is indeed the case, and we will see how that will help us in our understanding. Okay, so that, that's something we'll try to do as we go forward. Now, I gave you examples of translational invariance, which means you know, here if you have this figure, you have a bunch of birds, they're all spread out uniformly. You could be any one of the birds, if things would look the same if this didn't end, if there were no edges. And rotations are different. Rotations mean you could have a preferred point, but about it, things look the same, no matter where you are. Okay, so the two concepts are different uh, in general, but in our universe, at the biggest of scales and at early enough times, you have both these symmetries. Okay, so um, you might ask, how are these conclusions reached? Well, I gave you some evidence for, for the conclusions. Uh, and, and it's uh, by measurements like this that we reach them. But actually, these measurements, as I told you, don't pertain to the very earliest of epochs. They come to us, the cosmic microwave background comes to us about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Um, the age of the universe is about 13.8 billion years. But we like to actually take what we learn from the CMB and so on, and now actually go even further back using theory to extrapolate ourselves even further back, as you'll see, to about a nanosecond after the Big Bang. That's how well we know the fundamental laws of physics today to make that extrapolation. And when we go that far back, you'll see that these conditions actually of isotropy and homogeneity are actually very puzzling, are very puzzling uh, that the universe should have had these symmetries so far in the past. So let me elaborate on that. Experiments telling us about the state of the universe here and our attempts to extrapolate and go much further back. Now at first sight it might seem, well, what's so surprising if the universe is isotropic and homogeneous in these experiments which probe what the situation was like about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. It might seem that in fact homogeneity and isotropy should be the natural state of affairs so far after the Big Bang. For example, if you have a gas in a, in a box, it doesn't matter where the gas started. Maybe it started uniform to begin with. Maybe it started all clumped up to begin with. If you wait long enough, if you just wait, wait till the molecules are, interact with each other, they'll be spread out more or less uniformly in the box. So in other words, things will look, if you were neglecting edge effects, will look translationally invariant and rotationally invariant if you're somewhere in the center of the box. So maybe that's all that's happening. 380,000 years is a long time after the Big Bang. Didn't matter what happened earlier, but long time elapsed. No wonder the universe is looking so isotropic and homogeneous to us. So why am I making such a big deal about it? Well, the reason is, so in a, in a gas in a box, the molecules will become homogeneously distributed. However, the reason why I'm making a big deal is the universe is different. It turns out 
for the universe because we know the laws of physics well enough we can estimate things and it turns out not enough time has elapsed even 380,000 years after the Big Bang because the universe is a very big place not enough time has elapsed for physical processes to have established the observed isotropy and homogeneity okay there's just not enough time light travels at a finite speed and that's a limitation a fundamental limitation to how fast things can exchange energy and matter with each other equilibrate with each other and create isotropic and homogeneous situations from initial and isotropic situations and if you make that estimate it turns out that this is just not enough time let me try to put it in a more pictorial way here was you know oh this hasn't come out too well this is the the w map uh, map of the sky where the fluctuations in temperature are only one part in 10 to the 5 if you estimated what is the size of a region which could have come into equilibrium from the start of the big bang up till the instant where this light originated it's only the size of this disk about one degree okay so we might have been able to understand if the temperature was uniform on one degree scales but this temperature is uniform on the scale of the whole sky about 360 degrees okay vastly bigger and that's a big mystery causal processes exchanges of energy and matter cannot do not allow for isotropy and homogeneity to be uh, to arise on such vast angular scales okay and so that is why one is led to conclude that to begin with very early at least after the big bang the universe was to begin with isotropic and homogeneous then of course it evolved in an isotropic and homogeneous way giving rise to this kind of a map which is uh, where, where there are very small fluctuations okay so the region in causal contact as it's called within which matter and energy could have exchanged information is much smaller okay well I'd like to just tell you a little bit more about that to, to tell you that things are somewhat quantitatively precise now the conceptual framework to actually do cosmology is provided by Einstein's general theory of relativity and that's a very good time this is a very good time to bring it up because this is the hundredth year okay he wrote his great paper in 1915 and this is the hundredth anniversary of that great paper so that's a remarkable achievement but one we can't go into today here is a pretty good cartoon of how we think about things some of you have seen this I'm sure think of the universe as the surface of a balloon then we know that the radius of this balloon is growing with time okay that's why the universe is expanding if you go back the radius is shrinking with time but the rate at which it is growing so r is the radius the rate at which it's growing Einstein tells us r dot in units of r the velocity if you like is governed by the energy density of matter that fills up the universe okay here I wrote down a metric and uh, if you're not familiar with what a metric is it doesn't matter it'll come again once in the talk a metric is a way to encode what distances are and the one difference uh, in, in the case of relativity is that you have not only space but also time okay so some of you all of you have seen what the metric of a sphere is you know d theta square plus sine square theta d phi square with r the radius in front of it right in polar coordinates well this is something similar except you're both space and time because you're doing relativity but it doesn't matter r that radius is the parameter and how it changes with time is determined by what is the matter energy that makes up the universe now um, you can uh, you can make various estimates if your universe is dominated by matter as opposed to radiation then you find that this region which can come into causal contact grows linearly with time and if it's dominated by radiation as opposed to matter whether it's matter or radiation dominated it turns out it's proportional to time it only grows like the linear power maybe the coefficient in front changes but not the power law okay and this is well known and very reliable and we know about the fundamental laws of physics well enough to be able to extrapolate all the way from 380,000 years where we see the light uh, to about a nanosecond after the Big Bang okay about a nanosecond after the Big Bang and we know that matter or radiation not of a fairly familiar kind filled and dominated the universe at that time and that meant that at best 
the causal region could have grown linearly with time. Okay? That's just not enough growth to have been able to connect that whole map with each other, only those small disks with each other. Okay? So that's how we know, that's how we know that the isotropy could not have arisen because of physical exchanges. Here is the same information on this plot. As you go down here, you go back in the history of the universe. We are here about 14 billion years after the Big Bang, which occurred here. We go back around 400,000 years after the Big Bang is where the cosmic microwave background radiation originates, which we saw uh, has been measured so well. But we know enough about the physics to go further back in time. Three minutes after the Big Bang is where nucleosynthesis happened. The, the various light elements were synthesized. We go further back, about a, a microsecond after the Big Bang is where the quark-hadron transition occurred. We can go reliably back all the way up till the electroweak transition. We know enough about particle physics to be able to do this really quite reliably. And that takes us to about a nanosecond. Okay? So that's why I say we can extrapolate from here all the way back here very, very reliably. And we know that the region of causal contact only is growing linearly in time. And that's just not enough, that's just not enough growth to be able to causally connect the entire universe. We don't know what happened before that. We don't know what happened before that. But if what made up the universe was more or less the kind of stuff that makes it up today or the kind we have probed in colliders all the way up till about a nanosecond, then that doesn't help because if it's yet another kind of radiation or yet another kind of matter, it doesn't give us enough growth, only linear growth in time, which is not enough for us to be able to causally connect most of the universe. So that is why the very initial conditions themselves must have been very, very special. Okay? And so, so you see how, I mean, it's kind of remarkable sitting here that we can deduce something like this, but because of the exquisite experiments which have been done on cosmology and because of the ex remarkable experiments that have happened in particle physics, we can take this data, we can extrapolate it back, and we find we can conclude something about the universe a nanosecond after the Big Bang. I mean, it's really hard to believe, but it really is quite a reliable extrapolation. Okay, um, so what's the way out? We seem to have started with a very, very special universe. And as I said, we don't like surprises. So the, there is a theory around which says, well, starting at about a nanosecond, if we went further back, something dramatically different happened. Okay? It wasn't just more of this linear growth that I told you about. Something dramatically different happened. Because that was so dramatic, actually the entire sky in the cosmic microwave background radiation map, the entire sky is causally connected, not just those small patches of one degree in size. Okay? What was that dramatic event? It goes by the name of inflation, and that's what I'd like to tell you about a little bit today. Now, what does inflation in the cosmological context stand for? Certainly not this, not the rise of prices driving us all to despair. It stands for something similar, but not, not prices going up exponentially, but the entire universe growing exponentially in size. The size of this balloon, okay, itself growing exponentially with time. And as a result, the size of the causally connected region, which can exchange energy and so on with each other, despite the speed of light being finite, also growing exponentially in time. So this is the idea of inflation. So the idea is that the universe grew exponentially rapidly in the far past, very far past, maybe one nanosecond or so after the Big Bang. That's what really took over. As a result, the causally connected region is much bigger than our earlier estimate and big enough to explain the observed isotropy, for example, of the cosmic microwave background. So that's the idea. The balloon has a radius r, and r grows now exponentially with time, not linearly in time, as we found for more familiar kinds of matter energy. OK, now how can we get such exponential growth? Now we enter the realm of theory. OK, I'm theorizing here. We're trying to construct an example where you could do something radically different. But you'll see that that 
theorizing will lead to experimental consequences which we hope to be able to test. So far there are some consequences in agreement with experiment, but going further we hopefully will be able to test them. So that's the nature of the game. So how do we get such exponential growth? Familiar kinds of matter or radiation I told you, uh, if they dominate the matter energy of the universe, they won't do. They just give us linear growth. We want exponential growth. So instead, we need something else. And the idea is the following, uh, that in fact there was something else which dominated some other form of matter that dominate matter energy, that dominated the energy density of the universe very, very early on. And this came from what's called a scalar field with a potential not so different from the kind of potential energies we learn about in physics 101, maybe in L1, in L7, except instead of a harmonic oscillator, it's some scalar field. Every point in space time has a degree of freedom associated with it and a potential. And all together in unison, every oscillator at every point in space time in unison rolls on some potential. Okay, and that gives you not an energy, but an energy density, which can behave very differently from familiar matter or uh, matter or, or, or radiation and give rise to exponential growth. So, so here it is, here it is. This is the kind of potential you need for such a scalar field and it has to be slowly, gently varying. If it were nearly constant, you would get perfect exponential growth, but you want it to very slowly slide down because you want that exponential growth to end and the universe to match on to the more familiar kind of matter, energy dominated universe we see around us. So you give it a slight slope, make it end eventually, but to the extent it's nearly constant, it turns out you get this exponential expansion. And this scalar field, this degree of freedom which has this potential has a name, it's called the infliton. Now all of this might seem very, very fanciful to you and it is speculative, uh, but it has experimental tests I'll come to. But let me say that the idea that you have these kinds of degrees of freedom in the universe, you have these kinds of what I'm calling scalar fields, is not, I think, so fanciful now, especially after the discovery of the Higgs boson. I think all of you heard about this discovery of the Higgs boson that happened last year. It's a great discovery. And the Higgs boson is exactly this kind of a scalar field, okay? Not, maybe we needed an extra scalar field called the infliton, but it's, it's sort of a similar beast. And so we have more confidence in this kind of a speculation after this remarkable discovery made last year. And just to tell you a little bit about this discovery, it's quite a remarkable discovery. You know, this discovery was made at CERN they, they had to build a tunnel which was 27 kilometers long. Now you say, okay, you know, engineers not impressed with 27 kilometer long tunnel, but it has to be an incredibly high vacuum, okay? It has to be cooled. The entire 27 kilo, this is extreme engineering, believe me. 27 kilometers have to be cooled down to two degrees Kelvin, minus 271.3 degrees centigrade. You have to line it with superconducting magnets because you need a big enough magnetic field the particles which move in this tunnel move at 0.9999 out to many decimal figures times the speed of light. Okay, so they're really very fast and you have to curve them around and that requires intense magnetic fields. You only get them in superconductors. So you have to produce superconducting magnetic field. You have these magnets, superconducting ones lining the 27 kilometers. You have to cool them so you have to fill the entire tunnel with liquid helium and then you have to do this experiment. Okay, so it's really an incredible, incredible tour de force, but they pulled it off and that's how they measured this Higgs boson. Here, here's a uh, indication. This is one of the detectors. By the way, India has built one of the outer rings here, the outer hadron calorimeter, which I think especially in the new run, which has just started now, is gonna play a very big role. Uh, people at TIFR and so on have built that. To give you a sense of scale, a human being is sort of, you know, down here, you can't even see them. These are gigantic things, 10, 12 floors in height, okay? So remarkable, remarkable uh, experiments from which we know now that such scalar fields are around and therefore it's not so fanciful that maybe uh, the entire phenomena of inflation could have happened very early on in the universe. Okay, now we'll come back to the question of isotropy and homogeneity. How does this help? with the isotropy and homogeneity. It turns out if the universe went through such a dramatic, exponentially growing phase, what it does is smooth out any initial wrinkles in space-time. 
or any initial wrinkles in the distribution of energy and matter. Roughly speaking, each wave gets frozen because of the very rapid expansion and simply gets pulled so that the energy goes to longer and longer wavelengths and just dissipates away. So the, the very rapid expansion provides a very natural way to take an initially inhomogeneous or an isotropic situation and turn it into a nearly, nearly perfectly homogeneous and isotropic situation. And that is how then we can explain the observed and isotropy and, and homogeneity. However, and you know, in theory, in theoretical physics, if you set out to explain a phenomena and you build a theory which explains the phenomena, well, that's okay. You know, you knew what you wanted to achieve, you achieved it, so what? But you get confident about things when you get a bonus, when there's something else you didn't set out to explain and it naturally fits into place. Okay, and when that happens, then you get a feeling, aha, uh -huh, maybe I'm really on the right track. And that happens in inflation because you do get something of a bonus, okay? And the bonus you get is the following. Remember I told you that the temperature in the cosmic microwave background map was not exactly the same, okay? There were fluctuations of one part in 10 to the five. Not big, but there were those fluctuations, okay? And it turns out that while inflation smooths out to a very good extent, the initial anisotropy or inhomogeneity, it gives rise to a, an isotropy of its own. And we'll come to that in a minute. It, it gives rise to an isotropy of its own and therefore provides a mechanism both to explain to a very good extent the observed isotropy and also the small departures from it. Now you might say, who cares? One part in 10 to the five, it's hardly important. If this is your big bonus, it's like you know one of these BATA bonuses, right? 1.9999, you didn't pay two rupees, you know. Why is it important? Okay, well, it turns out these small fluctuations are extremely important. And they're actually quantum, as I'll tell you in a minute. But the reason why they are very important is the following. These small fluctuations, which are only one part in 10 to the five when the universe is about 400,000 years old, grow over time. And they grow over time because gravity has an inherent instability in it. You see, suppose you had a, a system where you had a small excess of matter somewhere and a small you know, deficit of matter somewhere else. Now, as you know, matter attracts more matter, okay? So where you have a small excess, more stuff will fall in and that excess will grow. And as it grows, it'll attract more matter. Okay, and conversely, where you have a smaller amount of matter, it'll lose more matter. So small initial perturbations grow as the universe grows. And the result is, if you look at the universe today, not in the CMB which comes to us, as I emphasized very early on in the history, but if you look at it today, it's extremely inhomogeneous, okay? As you know, we all live in a galaxy. Our galaxy is in part of a cluster of galaxies. And Clusters of galaxies can lie within clusters of clusters of galaxies. After a point, it stops, but you have structure on very large scales in the universe today. Here is a picture of that. Here you have various clusters which have been imaged here. This is just the plane of the, our own galaxy, so take it out, but you're very, you have super clusters and clusters and so on. So matter is organized in the universe in a highly clustered form, not in an inhomogeneous way, at least out to some reasonable distance scale. And the understanding is that it's these in initial one part in 10 to the five perturbations that you see in the temperature fluctuations, is these things which grow over time to make up this large scale structure of the universe. And it's a beautiful theory, we still have to understand parts of it, but it works very well. Therefore, it's extremely important to understand the origin of these small fluctuations, because they give rise to the largest structures, the most classical and largest of structures in the universe today. So it's not one of these BATA bonuses, it's really the whole big thing, the whole structure of the universe which is at stake, and that's the bonus that inflation gives you. It both explains why the universe looks nearly isotropic, also explains the small departures, provides a mechanism for the small departures, which can then grow to form the structure at the largest of distance scales in the universe today. So just to tell you, how, how do these small fluctuations arise in inflation? You know, the exponential expansion is a very dramatic thing. And what happens is when the universe exponentially expands, the very fabric of space-time, 
the very fabric of space time has this exponential expansion. And that's such a tremendous ripping of the fabric of space time that because of quantum effects, there's an irreducible jitter that gets produced. You know, in quantum mechanics, you can't keep things completely still, right? If, if you have a harmonic oscillator, it has a potential, okay? The potential is, you know, the familiar potential, harmonic oscillator potential, right? All of you know what it is, x square potential. You might say, okay, where is, where is the minimum energy? It's at the bottom here. But in quantum mechanics, you know, you can't place the particle exactly here because the uncertainty principle says, look, if you know the position completely, you won't know the momentum. So there's always an irreducible jitter in quantum mechanics. And there is an irreducible jitter in everything, including in the very fabric of space-time. Okay, that is the amazing thing that comes out when you combine Einstein's general theory of relativity with quantum mechanics, that the very fabric of space-time itself has an irreducible jitter. And this exponential expansion during inflation enhances that jitter. Enhances that jitter, it's still small, but makes it big enough to account for that departure of one part in 10 to the five that we see in the temperature of the CMB. And so the fluctuations arise in inflation and they arise very amazingly due to quantum effects in the fabric of space time. And you can make an estimate for, for how big they are. The fabric of space-time, as I said, can be understood in terms of a metric, which is a way to encode for distances. So I write it like this in this abstract notation where x mu takes values over time and the three spatial indices. Never mind if this seems a little bit abstract. Here it is written out in more detail, okay, for you. So anyway, there's a way to encode this. And, um, and then, you can write it as a classical value, a classical value for the space-time and fluctuations about it, which is h mu nu, and you find that irreducible jitter is produced, and this is the extent of it. h is a parameter which governs the exponential growth, which goes like exponent, the, the size of the balloon, the size of the balloon grows uh, exponentially in time, and h is the scale which determines that rate. It's called the Hubble parameter. So that enters because it's due to the exponential expansion. It involves gravity, so it involves Newton's constant of gravitation that you all know. It involves quantum mechanics, so it has h bar Planck's constant, which he invented to explain the black body radiation. And it's a relativistic effect, so it involves the speed of light. So it's an amazing formula. It combines all of these together. And this is what gives rise to the kind of jitter. For the experts, I'm simplifying things here. This is what would happen for the tensor perturbations in inflation, not the scalar perturbations, but allow me to make that simplification here. So this is how, so Gn, H bar, C, all enter in that remarkable formula. And it's this jitter in the very fabric of space-time, which then gets imprinted on the CMB, which then grows because of the gravitational instabilities to form the universe we know about us at the largest of distance scales. The most classical of distance scales. Uh, usually, we learn in the labor, in our physics courses, that quantum mechanics happens at small distances, inside atoms, okay? And as you go to larger and larger distance scales, when you come to distance scales of the human body, or you come to distance scales of L7, things are classical. And certainly when you go out to the galaxy and clusters of galaxies, things should be more classical. And they are, of course. But the origins of those structures, you see, are tied in the theory of inflation, at least, to quantum mechanics. And this is another great example, then, of this tie-in in physics between the very small and the very large. Okay? So, so that's what happens. That's the bonus in inflation, and that's why we're excited about it. But of course, we don't just stop there. We want to know experimentally, how will we know if the theory of inflation is correct? So therefore, this bonus gives us something very important. Okay, well, the way we would know, and I, I won't go into it very much, but just tell you a bit in words, is that, as I told you, they have measured the temperature-temperature correlation. I told you in the CMB, they measure the temperature in one direction, and they measure it somewhere else as a function of angle. That, if you're used to thinking about statistics and so on, is like a two-point function. You measure the temperature, and the temperature somewhere else is a function of the angle. But you can measure three-point correlation, higher moments, if you like, and, and, and gather more statistics. And that's the kind of measurement which they're going to try and attempt going forward. And it turns out that if inflation is correct, you get very characteristic 
characteristic predictions for large classes of inflationary models which arise purely from symmetry considerations for these higher moments. And those predictions we can make today will hopefully be tested against experiment, we hope, and if proved right, will give us further confirmation of the theory of inflation. And these involve very beautiful new symmetries of scaling invariance. I'll just show you one picture and then we'll not go into it. If you have this picture, you're a tree with branches. The branches become sub-branches. The sub-branches become sub-branches and so on. But if this went on, you could look at any little part of the tree and it would look like the whole tree. Just magnify it and it looks like the whole tree. This is an example of a system which has scale invariance in it. And this is a generalization of this concept of, here's another picture, very beautiful picture. This is a fractal, as you know. You have a triangle, inside it are little triangles, inside them are little triangles. If you keep looking, the structure looks the same, right? Okay, and so this is an example of scale invariance. Well, it turns out the symmetries that work in inflation are scale invariance and its generalization, which is called conformal invariance, which is a bigger symmetry, including scale invariance. And, and that's the kind of symmetry you can use to then make predictions. Um, and these are the kind of investigations we've been carrying out. And you know, you get very detailed predictions. Here is some three-point correlator, never mind the details. But it's a very detailed functional form. Here are some very detailed functional form, which comes out just from symmetries, which hopefully, as experiments go forward, can be tested and might provide then a good test for this idea of inflation. Okay, and so that's, that's how theorists do things. You have a puzzle, you come up with a scenario, in this case inflation, buys you a bonus, you're very excited about it, try to develop the theory further to come up with predictions, which hopefully then the experimentalists can test. So that brings me then to the end of my talk. Let me end with conclusions. I try to give you a snapshot today about the kind of progress in this remarkable field that has happened, the kind of precision with which we know things, and how well we can then use that to go back in time. This teaches us that there's very good evidence today that the early universe was in a very special state of homogeneity and isotropy. Inflation provides an attractive explanation for this fact. By inflation, I meant this epoch of very rapid exponential expansion way back about a nanosecond or so after the Big Bang. Many predictions of inflation can be understood on the basis of symmetries. Hope This part I didn't get a chance to elaborate on. Hopefully these can be tested in the future and then we'll allow a test for this remarkable idea of inflation. And more generally, there are two things I'd like to, start, I'd like to end by emphasizing in this talk, which are of a more general nature. And these are the following, and I think Professor Deshpande would especially like this. Uh, uh, like this, like me to have ended on this because he always liked to emphasize this in his lectures. That the deep truths of nature are all connected together. You see, the work that Planck did in understanding the black body spectrum in quantum mechanics comes back to teach us about the universe at the largest of distant scales. The fluctuations in quantum mechanics due to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle are also fluctuations in the very fabric of space-time which grow to become the larger structures in the universe which create galaxies in one of which there is a planetary system on which we live, okay? It's all connected in such a beautiful and intricate way. And well, it's hard to do better than Richard Feynman on this. Richard Feynman said so wonderfully, here he is, nature uses only the longest threads to weave her patterns only the longest of threads to weave her pattern so that each small piece of her fabric reveals the organization of the entire tapestry. Okay, this is another way to say that all the threads are actually interlinked with each other. So that's, I think, one of these deep things about physics which I hope in a small way I could bring out. And the second one, to go back to where we started, is this sense of wonderment, right? Here we are with a brain, as we learned yesterday, not in any way created to understand these deep truths, okay? Um, in a small planet, somewhere in some obscure corner of the universe, yet able to make sense and comprehend the universe in its totality. This is possible. Somehow one still is left with a sense of wonder. It need not have been so, but it's a great miracle of science that it is so. And here I must turn and quite fittingly to Einstein because he, after all, provided the conceptual framework 
In his famous paper a century ago, exactly in 1915, the general theory of relativity, as I said, the conceptual framework for the first time in the course of human history to be able to think about cosmology in a mathematically precise way. And so we, let's end with Einstein who said so wonderfully, he said, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. But it's a fact. It is comprehensible. And I think, I think that gives us such hope and motivation. And I think especially for young people, I invite you. I invite you to this grand, grand you know, journey which is underway in the field of particle physics, in the field of cosmology, and invite you to participate and join in it. Thank you very much. question well let me say that of course that's based on an extrapolation which could fail as I emphasize if you went back on this chart we were here we have data then we have known physics it gets to about a nanosecond then there's some speculation about inflation then you go further back and somewhere there's the there's the Big Bang right so we're not sure but if we do try to extrapolate the idea would be by the Big Bang is that there would be all over space, okay, a region of very high curvature, Planck scale curvature, with quantum effects where the, rip the fabric of space time itself has huge quantum fluctuations in it. But that would be going on everywhere. And so the reason we don't single out a region of space is that it should be happening everywhere, not in any preferred location. But it's speculation today, we don't know for sure. But um, that when we say that it happens, this is what we mean. have these fluctuations you are seeing them in the CMB for example how do you okay inflation as a theoretical idea says they are quantum but observationally could you tell that they are quantum okay and that's a great question and the answer is I don't know of a definitive experiment you could do today to tell that the kind of experiment you'd have to do is the analog of a Bell's inequality type of experiment whose result could not have come out could not be explained by classical hidden variables for example Okay, uh, I think that's the kind of experiment you'd have to do. Uh, there's some talk about trying to devise such an experiment, but at least in most garden variety models of inflation, uh, unless you make things very contrived, so far no one has been able to come up with a definitive explanation. So, so a direct measurement of H bar might be difficult, but the way we might get confidence is if inflation is correct, there is some functional dependence with a coefficient out in front which depends on H bar. That functional dependence we can try to measure in the lab. And then if that's coming out right, then you say, oh, maybe the mechanism is the one we think it is, where there is a prefactor which depends on H bar. So, so that's what we hope to do. Yeah, so there are also these evidences that uh, like, some of these fundamental constants might have been very different than the other Yeah. So H bar and so on. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, so one has to measure an appropriate dimension less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you would need to know enough independent parameters to be able to extract a quantity and then compare it with today. And um, these measurements are always very difficult to do when you go so far in the past. So I'm not sure how easy that would be to do. 
Um, if you come to uh, somewhat more recent epochs, if you're working at red shifts of you know, uh, Z of about two or three, then this kind of thing gets more doable. Uh, for example, if you can observe pulsars and so on, then people try to measure the uh, fine structure constant at early enough epochs. So I think on, on those kind of time scales, it should be possible. It would be great if you could do it so early on, but uh, so far I haven't thought about an experiment. I haven't heard of an experiment which might do it. Uh, if we could measure gravity, Something I didn't elaborate on is that while the, as the fabric of space time itself fluctuates, besides temperature fluctuations, you also produce gravity waves. And, uh, and I, di I didn't make that distinction too clear as I talked. If you could measure the gravity waves, and there's some hope we could do that, you get additional parameters. And then you can measure these higher point correlators maybe in gravity waves and so on. Then maybe you can tease some of these things apart but it seems rather challenging at the moment. So it would be great, and, uh, but uh, I think it remains to be seen. reason is simply that I set it equal to 1, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> but it's, there. it's there. By the time you, you can, that was, um, that was a fluctuation in, in uh, the gravitational potential, but by the time it gets converted to temperature, KB does appear okay. in the right places, so that uh, absolutely, uh, by the time you write it in degree Kelvin, KB is there, so sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, the, the, the data, I didn't, thank you, I, I didn't elaborate on that. You know, um, the, the red curve here is a theoretical curve, and it has five input parameters, as I said, and two of those input parameters pertain to how the fluctuations in, in uh, temperature originated, which in inflation occurred due to inflation. And the values you get, um, uh, one of those two parameters measures this, uh, is a quantitative measure of this idea that you had approximate scale invariance during inflation. And that's really a very integral part of the idea of inflation. And uh, so basically, um, there is some parameter, which if you were, if it were exactly scale invariant should have been one, and is measured to be 0 0.96. So, you know, it departs in the second uh, to one part into in the two. And actually in inflation, it's not exactly scale invariant because that potential, I told you, slowly sloped for the scalar field. If it were exactly constant, it would have been exactly scale invariant. So you expect some departures, but you expect approximate scale invariance. And that comes out very well to agree with the data. So at the level of the two-point function, all this test is the two-point function. There's very good agreement. And so thank you, I didn't get a chance to say that. That's one of the reasons why so far everything measured is in good accord with that idea. But yeah. Yeah, well, um, this is, if you like, a theoretical prejudice. But you know, to, to make the idea better defined, one would need a theory where some dimensionless quantity varied with time, right? Because dimensionful quantities, then you know, you, you can ask. So, in in Einstein's theory of relativity, what happens is the speed of light is kept constant, but distances change with time. Okay. Now, if you need a, a variant of that, where you are saying you're going to keep this, you know, what you need to have is a way to distinguish. Oftentimes, a theory where you might think you're, which is a different theory where the speed of light is changing, could be recast as a theory where a canonical measure is kept, like the speed of light is kept fixed, but distances change because those distances are measured in units 
where the speed of light is then held fixed. So, you know, the speed of light is measured vis-a-vis -vis some ruler, right? And distances are measured vis-a-vis -vis the same ruler, right? And so, you know, you need to ask that question in a way which would be different from relativity, where you, you define the ruler so that the speed of light stays the same, and then you allow for distances to change. And you, you, if there's another theory, it has to differ in some way. So, so it's not so easy to define a consistent theory like that. But if there is one, it can be interesting to ask if it differs in its quantitative prediction. So, so you said that uh, the universe is expanding at a Well, this is a, a very, very interesting question. Um, but more, sorry, I thought I had to take the mic. But, well, it's actually a very interesting question for the following reason. The expansion per se is not in conflict with the attractive nature of gravity because the expansion is really more like a velocity and what gravity gives you is a force which affects the acceleration, right? But you're right, uh, what this would suggest is that the acceleration, which is our double dot, should be such that things are, the acceleration should be such that the velocity is slowing down because distant galaxies should be attracting each other and that would suggest that the rate of expansion should be slowing down. Now, if you look at the data today, that is what people expected, but they find that actually the rate of expansion is speeding up, you know, and this is a big mystery and people think there's a new form of matter energy, it's called dark energy, which dominates the universe. That's what is causing the acceleration. Now I told you in inflation that actually there was acceleration because if the radius of the balloon grows exponentially, R dot and R double dot are also positive. So there's acceleration. So you could ask, what happens in inflation also? And actually, you know, I told you there was this potential for the scalar field which was positive and that's what was driving the, ex the expansion. We think today there might be something very similar. It might be, for example, that this original potential of the inflaton, you know, which was slowly sloping, didn't settle exactly to zero but to some small positive value of order some distance of time scale set by today's universe. And since it's positive, you are getting the acceleration you see today. So in other words, the, a positive value of the, cosmolo of the potential energy, ground state energy, that can give rise to acceleration somewhat counterintuitively, even though we would have naively expected gravity to attract. So it's a very good question, but uh, it, there are mechanisms by which you can allow an effect for gravity to repel on the longest of distance scales. And that's what happens in inflation, and at a vastly reduced energy scale, that's what might be happening in the universe today. Can we even try to infer that uh, uh, distortions that the exponential growth caused to the space time fabric could be one of the reasons? Time. You know, like I was saying, um, yeah, you might have, in, people might have in mind an alternative theory. You have to make it a little more precise to be able to test it. I don't know of a very good alternative to Einstein's general theory of relativity because you have to make sure that there's an operation, as VK Deshpande would have said, you have to make sure there's an operational definition, a sense in which you are your theory is different from general theory. You see, when you measure distances and times, everyone has to make some choice of rulers, you see. So, you know, it relatively makes a choice of rulers where the speed of light is kept constant, and other things are allowed to change. And you might have other choices of rulers where the velocity of light changes and distances change, but it could be recast in an equivalent way to the general theory. So if it's a truly different theory, then you know, one would have to see how it differs. But there are a few such examples I know which can't be immediately ruled out. Uh, so dimensionless quantities like the fine structure constant and so on, yeah, they could actually genuinely fluctuate. Uh, and um, that is something you could look at, but it's very difficult to look for that on these cosmological timescales. Uh, you need to look at typically some spectrum, some absorption lines and so on that you can do uh, you know, at closer by time scales.
But um, maybe someone has a clever theory. Maybe you have a clever theory, which is an alternative. Uh, I, I can send them to you, or I don't know. Yeah, maybe our, our foundation will put them up. We'll put them up. So. Also the video. Okay. Okay. The last question. Do you always do we always observe red seal, or do we sometimes observe the blue seal? Ah. Um, well, as far as I know. Um, on long enough distance scales, it's always red shift. Hubble's law is good. And um, I think, uh, as far as I know, there isn't any systematic effect indicating that the red shift turns around or something. Uh, so. Uh, well, maybe, maybe you mean just for due to local effects? Oh, yeah, yeah, at very, at very short distance scales, because we are part of a cluster. There, you know, you can have occasional local velocities and so on, peculiar motions and so on. That can happen. But if you go to cosmological distance scales, then I think all you see is the, the overall expansion, which is really an expansion of the universe. So. I think you're done. Uh, you can always add to this maybe offline. Sure, sure.